If you're based on the East Coast of the United States or even in Canada, no doubt you've experienced firsthand wildfires and the smoke and pollution that it's caused this week. What can the private sector do about this issue? And what can we do as investors to perhaps help the environment? We're here to discuss this with Andrew Channon. He is the CEO of Procure AM, uh, the issuer of FIXT, which is the Procure Natural Disaster Recovery ETF. Very interesting fund. Andrew, thank you for being on my show today. Thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. Let's just start with some news this week. I'm not based on the East Coast anymore. I was in Montreal, moved to the West Coast, so I can't say that I'm seeing this uh, from a first-hand basis, but I woke up, I think it was Wednesday or Tuesday earlier this week, to pictures on my social media of what looked like Mars, but in fact was New York City. So uh, this is quite incredible. I'm reading the news. The U.S. experience is worst I'm reading the Guardian article. It's worst toxic air pollution from wildfire smoke in its recent recorded history on Wednesday. Uh, the uh, This is the quoted a Stanford researcher. People were exposed to 27.5 micrograms per cubic meter of small particulate matter, which is uh, a lot higher than the uh, average safe amount that people should be exposed to. I think it's several times higher than what you should be exposed to. And so, you know, we're not here to comment on on why it happened. We're here to comment on what can be done to either prevent this or fix this. What is the private sector doing about crises like this? So there are a lot of different companies that, that are out there that can help with um, all aspects of fires, whether that's, you know, more contained fires within a building or something as as broad as, as an uncontrolled wildfire. And you have to look at, you know, the different parts of the life cycle for this. So, you know, before a fire even starts, say you're a municipality or you're a large corporation and you're going to be building something, you know, significant in size. Chances are you're going to be working with a consulting company, an engineering company, and a construction company. And when you're doing these uh, you know, major projects, one of these things that you're looking at is your know, risk for natural disasters. So you can do modeling. Um, and then once your models tell you what and where uh, you should be doing and putting things, then you build with that in mind. And whether that's flooding, whether that's uh, risk for wildfire, whether that's erosion and drought, um, you know, these are all things that are being considered when you do a major build. And there are numerous companies um, on that side of the, of, the, of the natural disaster that you can work with. Then when you have an actual thing like a wildfire, there are companies that you know, actually produce and build things and offer services that can help with um, trying to extinguish them or control them. So companies that uh, provide the actual vehicles like helicopters to, to drop water. Um, when you have uh, firefighters actually go in to try to put these fires out or to try to control them, uh, you know, they're using hoods and breathing apparatuses and, and hoses and pumps, uh, you know, your fire engines. Uh, you know, these are things, whether it's a, a small uh, fire in a, in a building in your town or whether it is a wildfire as well. Now, uh, I'm not saying we should be betting on natural disasters. That's a terrible thing to say. But uh, people have written articles and studied, uh, not even people, but banks have studied stocks that have done well post natural disasters. Post Katrina, for example, Hurricane Katrina, uh, several stocks have done well. Home Depot, home building stocks, insurance companies, companies like Masco, Halliburton, um, uh, medical suppliers. So we, we're seeing this trend of disaster relief companies or home building companies, insurance companies do better. Um, is that something you've noticed as well? Well, I was actually down in Louisiana during Hurricane Katrina, uh, starting off my my junior year at Tulane University when Hurricane Katrina struck and. Um, yeah, that's been something that's you know, certainly stuck with me as well as living in New York City during Hurricane Sandy and seeing the, the effects of these natural disasters firsthand and you know, being a, a New Jersey resident now and seeing the, the smoke outside of our windows uh, you know, earlier this week. Uh, you know, it's a constant reminder. And uh, you know, people will do these studies, but not every natural disaster is the same. Um, you know, I certainly remember, uh, you know, energy prices being something that became in focus during Hurricane Katrina when you know, many of your offshore and refineries were, were affected by the storm. Um, you know, a volcano, a wildfire, hurricane, flooding, um, you know, there, there could be a, you know, a vast array of companies that may benefit or may be hindered by the disasters and also depending on regionally where they take place. 
So, um, you know, it's difficult to necessarily predict, you know, who the winners will be, but what this um, index that our fund tracks looks to do, it, it is a passive index. It is equally weighted and you know, the weights all come back to equal weight at times of uh, rebalance and reconstitution, but it's looking for companies that help with, um, you know, call it the consulting, the construction, the engineering companies that help us rebuild um, after natural disasters, as well as build out appropriate uh, and precautions for when you're um, you know, trying to build these massive structures to, to make sure that they take these risks into consideration. Um, it looks at companies that help um, provide equipment, vehicles, other apparatuses that are helpful during uh, natural disasters. So you know, for Katrina, you think of you know, how important it is to, to pump the water and move the water. Uh, when the when the waters recede, you need to uh, you know clean the water. You need to clean the soil so that it's usable again and protects the inhabitants. Uh, and then, like you mentioned, the Home Depots, the Lowe's, if you're in Australia, a West Farmers. These are the companies that uh, you know people go to to rebuild and pick back up where things um, you know left off before the storm. So you know it's a wide range of companies. And then also you know down in Texas, you had the the big freeze two winters ago. People were left without power for weeks on end. So companies that help with mobile power uh, generation or things like a, a Generac uh, that makes generators. These are companies that are in, in very high demand in many cases during and after a natural disaster. So uh, another thing that they also look at uh, for the index is companies that have uh, contracts currently or recently with uh, agencies like FEMA or um, you know similar agencies around the world as this is a global fund and this is a global phenomenon. Natural disasters can strike anywhere at any time. So what is the impetus behind starting this fund? I think the inception date was last, well, exactly a year ago, June 2022. Uh, what's your inspiration for doing this? This was um, a concept that I've been working on for a while, and uh, certainly dating all the way back to, to when I was um, in Louisiana during Hurricane Katrina, um, kind of uh, you know, interested in finance as well, understanding that you know, there are many companies out there that actually help us um, with regards to natural disasters. This isn't, you know, uh, a low carbon ESG classified fund. We're not marketing it as an ESG fund. You know, this is uh, a fund that we believe celebrates those companies that help us in, in our greatest times of need. And just last year, the White House came out um, with a study showing that they believe that the cost to the U.S. federal budget alone by the end of this century will be roughly $2 trillion a year from natural disasters and climate change. So when looking at putting together um, your know, first of their kind uh, exchange traded products for investors, you know, I look for things with uh, you know, long-term uh, you know, long horizons and um, you know, potentially large growth industries. And believe it or not, natural disasters um, have the potential to be uh, you know, a growth industry, unfortunately. But that's not necessarily something that um, you know we're saying. Oh, you should you know profit in times of peril, but we want to provide uh, exposure to these extremely critical companies. I'm just curious as to how the government has forecasted the uh, the future damages from natural disasters. I mean, what what assumptions are they using here? Well, so they look at many. Uh, the UN has also come out with its own um, their calculations for effects from climate change. But they look at you know, different models that, that they're able to prepare, looking at things like uh, rising sea levels, flooding, uh, frequency of natural disasters. Uh, one of the biggest reasons that uh, the U.S. represents typically one third on, uh, on any given year of the total cost of natural disasters is because of population centers and the amount of money uh, and concentration of high value assets when you have these large population centers. So you look at the Eastern seaboard, you look at the West coast of the United States, where we have you know, some of our largest population centers, you know, people have, you know, extremely you know, valuable items as well as companies that are located there. So, you know, these are in you know, high risk areas for sea level rise and flooding. Um, you know, certainly we've seen, um, you know, many predictions with just El Nino alone, potentially costing trillions of dollars over the next several years. And so they look at different weather patterns. They look at, um, all different types of things like erosion, drought, wildfires, um, you know, and they, they have to model those. And, you know, many people will also think that, you know, uh, you know, similar to the healthcare field that, uh, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And this is an area that things are heavily um, you know, are not being necessarily uh, invested in as much as they could be, but these are areas that that governments could be spending in. And you know, if they don't, 
uh, you know, the effects can be extremely expensive in the future. Okay, so let's take rising sea levels, for example. This is something that a lot of people talked about, concerned about. It's, it's a very real risk. What is the private sector doing about this? Yeah, you know, so, so much of, you know, when you look at, you know, sea level rises, um, you know, municipalities need to step in. I saw a report just uh, two weeks ago that New York City, believe it or not, is actually sinking. It's sinking and there's also, uh, you know, fear of rising sea levels. So, you know, there's a lot that they're doing to, to build up the walls and, and protect against that. Um, pumping, uh, you know, just being able to move water is something that's extremely important. And, um, you know, it's, it's something that you have to build and change code as things advance. After Hurricane Sandy, a lot of the coastline was eroded in New Jersey. So you had a company like Great Lakes Dredge and Dock that came in and helped, you know, rebuild over a dozen miles of New Jersey coastline. So there's a lot of things that, you know, companies can be hired to do. Um, you know, it's not just pumps. It's, you know, building things higher. Um, some are preventative. Some are, you know, when these actual things take uh, take effect having uh, you know things like uh, flood doors and gates and whatnot as well that you can utilize during the course of a storm to help better protect and insulate those areas that are at high risk. It's not just New York City; it's the entire coastline of the U.S. is potentially at risk. So I guess we're looking at construction companies, materials companies as a theme around. Let's just take rising sea levels for example. Exactly, consulting, engineering, construction. Um, these are you know the, the early stage in defense uh, types of companies that you can utilize, making sure that when you build something, you build it properly, looking at the potential risks and, and making sure you you take those into consideration. I noticed in your top ten holdings, Nvidia is on that list. Can you can you comment as to why? So Nvidia is on the list because they, um, you know, as we mentioned, the fund is one that equal weights its companies at rebalance, and it's had a stronger performance than. Uh, you know, the majority of the basket, which is why its weight is higher. But the reason that they're in the fund in the first place is that they they help with modeling and forecasting for natural disasters. So um, when a government's trying to determine where their high risk areas are, um, they're a company that can help. They've had uh, contracts with FEMA as well, and they use AI in their modeling. So believe it or not, natural disasters are yet another AI story. And uh, can you tell us about your selection process? No doubt you've come up with the narrow list from a very wide list of companies that may fit the criteria of being involved in the natural disaster recovery process. Uh, from there, how do you whittle down that list? Um, so, so it is looking at these companies that, that have direct business lines to things um, like prevention, mitigation, and recovery from natural disasters. It looks at uh, you know, uh, mobile uh, you know, uh, power generation like batteries and generators. So you have companies like uh, Cummins, and Generac that, that fit in there. Uh, companies that even individuals would utilize, particularly after a natural disaster. So certain uh, home goods and home repair types of stores. So your, your Home Depots and your Lowe's of the world, uh, your consulting construction engineering companies that, that come and help you rebuild after a natural disaster, as well as build and preventative measures before natural disasters occur into that, uh, into that large build. Uh, you have companies that de uh, develop specialty equipment that are used for natural disasters. So a company like an MSA Safety, they design a lot of um, helmets for firefighters, breathing apparatuses, um, uh, hoods, rescue equipment as well. Uh, you know, it's, it's a wide range, um, but these are you know, certain categories that can be included. And you know, additionally, if they, uh, as mentioned, have a contract with um, an agency such as FEMA or another um, foreign uh, similar counterpart, um, they're all potentially available for inclusion. And then certainly they have to meet various uh, liquidity and market cap um, parameters as well for inclusion. And, uh, and can you comment on some of the financial metrics that you would be looking for? Uh, it's not necessarily financial metrics. It, you know, it's, a, it's a passive index that is looking for um, you know, are you know are they involved in these business lines? Do they have these these uh, government contracts? Do they have liquidity and uh, and market cap? And if uh, if they check all these boxes, they um, could potentially make it. That there wouldn't be any red flags in their financials that would disqualify them from being in your in your fund. Um, you know, if if there is um, something that causes its price to um, you know and market cap to drop below certain levels, or you know becomes. A company that's uh, no longer has uh, the liquidity thresholds, 
Um, you know, those are things that could happen, you know, if there were red flags for the company, but there aren't necessarily things that if, you know, upon this specific type of event, it's removed. It, it, it really looks at these um, kind of more uh, fundamental um, market cap and liquidity parameters. Um, that said, if they if they no longer have FEMA contracts, um, you know, they've gone over five years without having one of these contracts or similar government ones, it could be removed. Or if they divest from these specific industries that help with natural disasters, um, they might also no longer qualify. Yeah, that's a good point. I was going to bring up that uh, that point you just mentioned. Uh, how many of these companies are dependent on government contracts primarily as a source of revenue? Um, it, it's tough to say how many are, are, are dependent on them. A lot of them do have a lot of um, a lot of contracts, uh, you know, facing um, uh, you know other businesses. Um, you know, whether it's you know, building on behalf of businesses. Um, you know, many of them do have these government contracts and, you know, particularly, you know, become in very high demand following a natural disaster when their services are required. Um, you know, companies like Home Depot are, you know, very well known for making considerable donations and providing volunteers uh, following natural disasters as well. Um, but, you know, many of these companies are, are facing uh, retail and, and companies as well and not just, you know, uh, solely relying upon municipalities and government contracts. This is off topic, but there was these... um companies, I was reading these private companies selling clean air from Canada to China. They were <laughs> bottling air. <laughs> I remember reading that a long, a long time ago and it sounds really familiar to the movie Spaceballs if, uh, if you remember <laughs> that one. I think India as well. They're selling it to India and China. Bottling air. Um, so anyway, my question is pollution. Is that something on your radar as part of the natural relief uh, or disaster relief umbrella? Yeah, so um, you know, to the extent that you, know, you have contamination, um, you know, those are things that your know, companies in, in the fund could help with. Uh, you know, this isn't a, a low carbon, a net zero, a Paris Accord, a renewable energy, a clean energy fund. This is something different. This isn't built to be ESG. And you know, the, the way I look at this is, you know, when you have a natural disaster, um, you're not going to care about what you know, the carbon footprint of the bank that you bank with is, you're going to, you know, need these companies, you're going to need their assistance. You know, as far as pollution, you know, th there are different things, um, you know, involved with climate change. This one, the focus is natural disasters. That said, um, you know, in many cases, there are parallels to man-made and man-accelerating disasters. So when you saw the, the train derailment in Ohio several months back, there were companies in this fund that were helping, like the Clean Harbors and a food row that were helping develop plans for how to bring these companies back. So, you know, pollution being something that, you know, could potentially, um, you know, lead to droughts or more forest fires or other things like that, you know, to the extent that, you know, there are companies in the fund that help aid with those issues, um, you know, they could potentially be beneficiaries of things like that. We're certainly not rooting for pollution, um, but there isn't necessarily a mandate or a focus on depolluting the environment or companies that are uh, driving down their carbon footprint. You know, these are companies that are truly out there doing work or providing services or products for those before and after disasters, during and or after. Interesting. All right. Well, Andrew, I appreciate your time and uh, good luck with the fund. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And thank you for watching. This is uh, David Lynn Report. Stay tuned for more and don't forget to subscribe.